Um, well, thank you very, very much for inviting me here to talk th this morning. Um, and I'm going to basically give you a very quick overview about games and learning um, and what I find so exciting about them and where I'm coming from in my research on games and learning. Um, I'm a research fellow uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University and really the reason that I got interested in games in the first place was that it seemed like the only way that I can find a job that I could pretty much legitimise mucking around the entire time. Um, and when I start, was started thinking about my PhD research and thinking about well, what should I do as a part of my research, games immediately sprung from my background in computing. Um, and being a gamer, I'd made a lot of assumptions in my initial research. Assumptions around why people play games, that all people play games, and why people play games for learning. Um, and I'd made this assumption, which is pretty common when you start to look at some of the literature around games and learning, is that everyone plays games, everybody is motivated by games, and this is the reason why games are so good for learning, because you can hide learning in games, people can learn without even knowing that they're learning, um, and everybody's motivated to play games. Um, unfortunately for my own research, um, I was given a bit of a shock with the very first set of focus groups that I organised, in which half the people that were in them went, we don't play games, we don't like games, and we wouldn't you want to use them in education anyway. Um, so this got me thinking in my initial research about, well, what is the purpose of games and learning? What are people motivated to do? Um, and how can we explore this? And this is some of the thoughts that I'm going to give you this morning. Um, so for me, there are kind of three really key areas why people or why we should be thinking about games in education. Um, and when I'm talking about games, I'm not talking about games that are designed to help you learn to rote learn. So to design to learn very basic memorization, um, facts memorization, this, this kind of game. And I'm also not talking about the type of games that allows you to do a bit of learning content and then you get rewarded by playing a game. Um, I like to use the, the term constructivist games. So it's about the type of games that embed and integrate what is being learned with how it's being learned in a purposeful and meaningful and playful way. So for me, there are really three key reasons for using games in learning. Um, the first one I want to talk about is action or active learning. Um, the fact that games, um, when used in this sort of powerful constructivist way, embody lots and lots of good principles of learning. So they allow people to be driven by problem solving, by puzzle solving, by meaningful goals, by meaningful purpose. They allow people to engage in an active experience. So they're actually doing something rather than simply being told something or watching somebody else do something. Uh, they allow people to take part in a simulated activity, to experience something they might not be able to experience in the real world. Um, and they allow people to work with other people in a collaborative way. Now, none of these uh, sort of learning paradigms are unique to games. And I, I think this is often something that gets attributed to games. Um, so, so great games can do it. Um, but actually, all of these ways of learning can and are used in, in the classroom. Now, my background is in higher education. Um, and I think it's fair to say that in the UK system, higher education still predominantly is based around a lecturer standing in front of a classroom and talking at people, as I'm doing now, just, just to give you an example. Um, and I think games is a really good way of getting people to rethink their pedagogy practices and to think how we can engage learners um, by getting learners to take part in more active learning. So I think the whole active side is, is really important. Um, secondly, engagement. While games may not intrinsically motivate every person, um, I do believe there are elements in games that motivate different people in different ways. Um, and we did some research um, in an alternate reality game that I'm going to be talking about this afternoon about the different aspects of games that are motivational. Um, and in the engagement side, um, I think we, we're really talking about this um, new model of gamification. And this is the idea that there are things within games that can motivate and engage people um, if we have a way of harnessing them uh, and using them in education. So this tends to be manifest at a very, fairly simplistic level um, using the, what, what's called the PBL system, the points, badges, leaderboards. 
which is basic competition, basic set collecting, and basic way of, of looking at how you're improving. Um, and again, I'll talk about this a little bit later on. Um, but I think there are more sophisticated ways of thinking about how we engage people, particularly to do with the structures that games have for getting people on board very quickly. The way that games, if you play a computer game now, you're, you don't have to read a manual. You don't have to go away and spend 20 minutes learning the game. The game supports you through the whole process of learning it intrinsically. And I think that's a very, very powerful model. Um, the way that games stimulate curiosity and mystery, the way that they use narrative to pull you in and to keep you going and to make you identify with the characters. Um, so I think there are, lo are lots of ways there about how the engagement structures in games, the structures around goals, the structures around rewards can be used in education, not necessarily in something that is actually a game. Uh, now, for me, the really exciting thing about games, and I think the thing that gets missed in a lot of the gaming literature, is the idea of games as playful environments. Um, now, I was having a bit of a rant yesterday about the use of the word serious games, and I hate this term. I think what serious games does is it delegitimizes playful games. There is absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, we should be lauding the fact that games provide us these safe, playful spaces in which we can try things out, in which there are a new set of rules and there are different ways of thinking about the world and constructing ourselves and constructing our interactions with other people. And this is so, so powerful. The idea of a magic circle where the boundaries are different and we can try things out, we can practice. For me, learning is all about mistake making, but mistake making in this safe, safe space. Um, and let's not have serious games let's say let's have games that are powerful and playful for learning and let's lord that and make legitimize that so i wanted to give you um, a few examples th three examples of games that i've been either peripherally involved with or that colleagues of mine have that i think exemplify these three areas of games um, and what i've tried to do with this model is to say that actually these are three ways in which games can engage learning or which I think are good for learning, but actually you can get games that, that encompass all of these. Uh, the first one is a game called Marketplace and actually if you, when you start to pull this apart, it, I'd say it's really a business simulation, but the way that it was used was very gameful. Um, and I was involved in evaluating this project probably about eight or nine years ago with a colleague of mine at Edinburgh Napier University where I used to, used to work. Um, and what, what happened with Marketplace is um, my colleague worked in, in uh, a marketing department. And this was a final year course on marketing called Applied Marketing. Um, and it was a follow-up course to a marketing theory course. And how it had traditionally been taught is through lectures. So people would come and get an hour told about applied marketing and the application of theories that they already knew about from the previous course. And then they'd be given the scenario in a tutorial that they talk about. So there was no idea of, of growing through week by week. There was no real idea of application of these methods because they were really just asked to, to analyze a scenario and then give a set answer. Uh, and what Marketplace does, and this is a, it's an American company, and what you do is you pay, um, and quite a small fee, we, we actually got a small grant to run this, um, for each student who's playing it. And what happens is, it, is it's the course is set up week by week um, and at the end of each week teams of students who formed their own companies make a set of decisions and then they're immediately given feedback on the results of these decisions in relation to the other um, the other groups that are in are in the game and what we found with this is that suddenly from a course where students were not terribly interested there was a massive amount of, of interest in the decision making because the students were given agency over what they were doing. They could really see how they could apply what they'd been doing in the previous course to the situations that they were being given in a real situation. They could see how what they were doing was, um, how it was giving them a position in terms of the other people in the class. Uh, and what, what we did was made sure that the assessment was linked to the game, but not contingent upon performance in the game. So that halfway through, they were asked to look at their marketing strategies and give a presentation to the board of directors, which was all the other students. Um, at the end of the course, they were asked to reflect on the learning process, and there was a small amount of the mark for a personal reflection. But most of it was reflecting on the decisions that they'd made and the consequences of those decisions and how they would go on to write a marketing plan for the future. So for me, 
Actually, whilst it's called a game, it isn't really a game. The things that make it gameful was the playfulness with which the students approached this, um, the whole ac active learning and giving the agency and control to the students, uh, and the fact I was amazed at the power of the competition. I mean, these were business students, so they may, without wanting to generalise, have been a little more competitive, but um, the type of engagement that we got was absolutely incredible. And I was involved with interviewing and talking to the students afterwards. And the way that they talked about their learning experience, this being the best course they'd ever taken, they were engaged in a way that they'd never understood things before, they'd never applied what they were learning before. Um, a second example, and I think for, for me this exem exemplifies some of the principles of engagement that I was talking about, um, is a game that was run by a friend and colleague and co-author of mine, um, Alex Mosley, at the University of Leicester. Uh, and this is a game which I always get it wrong and in the wrong order. It's the great history conundrum. Uh, and the problem that he had was when they, he teaches history, um, and they, they would get first year students coming through the door with very, very low information literacy skills. They'd all be great at using Google, but very, very poor at being able to evaluate how the, the quality of resources or being able to apply them or being able to decide what was a genuine resource on the internet and what wasn't. Um, so what he did was rather than um, the old way, the system of doing it, which was basically a one hour lecture on here's information literacy, here might be a few web examples you can work through, uh, he implemented this game. And what happened was it ran over four weeks and students were emailed puzzle cards. Um, and there's an I think there's an example on the slide there. And these puzzles were of varying difficulties. Um, and students had in their own time as many puzzles as they wanted to collect. Um, they could also swap puzzle cards with other people. They could also collaborate on puzzle cards. Uh, and these puzzles were all various aspects of information literacy. Um, or being able to use the library system, being able to think critically about uh, the information that's online and how we use it. Um, and then once they'd, they'd managed to solve the puzzles, they got points for them. Um, and they could, they could keep solving the, the, them, or they could stop as soon as they'd achieved the sort of baseline that they needed to achieve. Um, now this was marked, and it was partly assessed on how many puzzle cards that students had engaged with. It was partly assessed on the discussion that went around the puzzles. So while students weren't allowed to sort of give answers out, they were allowed to give hints and tips to other students. So there was a discussion board around that, and there was a metric for the criticality of the discussion, which was marked by PhD students. So again, the assessment was very much tied into how the game ran. Um, and again, what, what Alex found with this was that students were not doing just the bare minimum, that they were going in and they were trying to solve all the cards and they were working together in a really deep and reflective way that he hadn't ever seen before in first year students coming straight from school. Um, and that because of the game mechanisms, um, the, the, the progression, the points, the way in which um, students were immediately rewarded with feedback and, with, and the way that the process was scaffolded, um, that the engagement again was massively higher in the learning from it was more apparent. Um, finally, and I absolutely love this photo, this, is, this embodies the idea of playfulness. Um, and this is from a game that I helped a colleague at Manchester Metropolitan Design called Staying the Course. Um, and this is a board game. And while I've written a lot about digital games, I'm getting more and more excited about the power of traditional games in teaching and the way that it gives people agency to control and create their own games. Um, and my friend Claire, Claire Hampshire, who designed this, is a physiotherapist, and she's very heavily involved, again, in student induction for students coming straight from school um, into first year. And the problem here has been that a lot of students have, have come in with, with no expectations of university, no expectations of what is needed in terms of academic skills, no, no expectations in what's needed in terms of money management, in terms of where you go for pastoral support. Um, and what this, course, this game, Staying the Course, does is it gets students to talk about these type of issues in a sort of fun environment. Partly the students that take part in it don't know each other. They've only been at university days, hours, a week. Um, and partly it, it's quite intimidating to be with a bunch of strangers and to admit that you don't know stuff, even though nobody knows stuff and you're not really expected to know stuff. So what this game does is it provides a very playful forum for students to actually think about, well, what are my expectations? In this situation, what would you do? Where do you go? Who can you go to for support? 
Um, and as you can see, the feedback of the students is that they absolutely love it. It's a great, playful way to break down these barriers, create this magic circle in which it is safe to admit that actually I'm scared and I don't really know what I'm doing. So I think that's, that's a lovely example. Um, so I just wanted to finish with a little bit about where I think educational game is going to be going in gaming is going to be going in the future. Um, as we all know, we're in the middle of a more or less global recession, um, and universities and schools just don't have the money to be spending on the high-end games that they might have had previously. I certainly can't get any funding to build any, um, and this is what has led my own research and my own passion in this idea of gaming on a budget. Um, and I'm getting more and more fascinated by ways of enabling teachers and lecturers to build their own games. Um, and, and this could be through using the many game building softwares that are growing up uh, and, and are now available and, and are pretty easy to use and don't necessarily require a great deal of programming or game design experience. Um, but I think one of the issues is that, that typically we have game designers who are excellent at what they do and excellent at designing gameful and engaging experiences and we have teachers who are excellent at what they do in, in terms of teaching and learning and often the two don't talk to each other. But this is where I think gaming on a budget can really help because it, it allows um, teachers to, to have an idea of what gaming can bring and to develop prototypes and to try things out and to try things out with students um, either using electronic games or, and then getting much more, more and more passionate about traditional games, using game forms that already exist and tailoring them for different educational situations. Oh, okay, one minute, I'm going to be very, very quick. Um, okay, the, uh, beyond badges, I talked a little bit about gamification before, um, and I think we're going to start seeing more sophisticated gamification beyond the points, badges, leaderboards um, model, moving on to... Um, to look at more sophisticated ways in which the um, ideas from games can be used, looking at curiosity, looking at narrative, looking at, at more, more sophisticated and rich ways of, of using game ideas in teaching and learning. Um, and finally, I think w this is something we may come back to later, the idea of the player becoming the creator, what I like to call student-centered gaming, so it's no longer about there being a game that pushes content or pushes skills or knowledge or education on students, but it's about students taking the agency for designing their own games, for thinking about the game process and for the player becoming the creator. And that whistle stop ending. Um, time for questions or are we moving straight on to David? We'll move more straight to David. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.